Chapter 24, The Origin of Species. Theory of evolution by means of natural selection suggests that what species are is not what species have always been or what they will always be. So this suggests that boundaries between species are not always going to be as rigid as you might think. So uh, what evolutionary theory can help us to look at is the pattern by which uh, new species can evolve. Now, in the previous chapter, we looked at microevolution. We looked at changes in allele frequencies through time. Uh, Macroevolution is the idea that not just populations change through time, but populations can change so much that they can become uh, new taxa, new species, new genera, new families, etc., uh, by the same processes that drive microevolution. So that's what we're going to consider in chapter 24. So what is a species? Well, like I just sort of suggested, the definition of a species uh, can be difficult to put a pin in exactly. Uh, we know it when we see it, or so we think. Uh, a species comes from the Latin word meaning kind or appearance. Uh, it comes from the same root word as specific, whereas genus uh, has the same root word that gives us words like general, so general and specific. Uh, so how we define species is going to depend a lot on the organism. The biological species concept is one of the easiest to grasp. Uh, and this definition of reproductive isolation, uh, the definition of the spe biological species concept relies heavily on reproductive isolation. But there are other ways of looking at what a species is, uh, depending on what kind of organism you're looking at. So in the biological species concept, we define a species as a group of populations whose members uh, have the potential to interbreed in nature and produce viable, fertile offspring. And when you see viable and fertile, you should be thinking uh, these offspring are able to survive and reproduce. And what does that mean? It means they're fit. That's how we define fitness, is the ability to survive and reproduce. So they do not breed successfully with members of other populations. They are reproductively isolated from other populations. So the thing that, uh, that's what defines a species as different from another species. But what holds a species together is the gene flow between populations. So think about your dog, or a dog that you know. And you might look at dogs and say, how is that chihuahua over there possibly related to my dog? Or how are Great Danes and chihuahuas possibly related to each other? Uh, they seem to be pretty well reproductively isolated from each other. Um, a Great Dane and a chihuahua would not probably have very... Uh, successful puppies. But the thing is, it's not about whether they can mate with each other directly, uh, whether they're capable of producing these viable fertile offspring directly, but is there gene flow between Chihuahuas and Great Danes? And there very much is. Uh, maybe a Great Dane couldn't mate with a Chihuahua, but a Great Dane could mate with a dog of a smaller breed, a Chihuahua could mate with a dog of a larger breed, and it's easy to imagine that uh, a mutt that you might have, a dog that has many breeds mixed all together, could possibly have both Great Dane genes and Chihuahua genes in the same organism. So that mutt is proof that there is gene flow between uh, breeds that are as distinct as Great Danes and Chihuahuas. So it's that gene flow that's going to hold the, the species concept for a dog uh, together. And uh, there is going to be, within a species, heritable diversity. There's going to be diversity. Some of it's going to be heritable, and that's one of our 
central tenets of theory of evolution is that there is heritable diversity within a species. That was one of Darwin's observations. Uh, sometimes we may see species that appear uh, to be very similar even though we recognize them as distinct species. So over here, this is a western meadowlark. While this over here is an eastern meadowlark. And how do you know the difference between an eastern meadowlark and a western meadowlark when they look so similar to each other? And one of the best ways to tell the difference is really just to look at a map. Uh, if you are in Alabama and you see a meadowlark, uh, there's a very, very, very strong likelihood that what you're seeing is an eastern meadowlark, whereas if you're in uh, California or Oregon or Washington and you see a meadowlark uh, perched on a wire fence, then it's going to be a western meadowlark. But if you had the two birds in hand, um, it might be very difficult for anyone but the, the, an expert or an ethologist to identify any morphological or, or differences in appearance between those two species. So, how do we f define reproductive isolation? Uh, it's the existence of factors that impede uh, two organisms from producing these fit offspring. But we do find, as we would expect from evolutionary theory, that there is there are exceptions to this rule. We can see crosses between different species, or what we recognize as different species, uh, but we still consider them to be discrete and distinct species uh, for reasons that we can define. And reproductive isolation uh, can be classified by whether the factors that are impeding uh, reproduction occur before or after fertilization. Are they prezygotic or are they postzygotic? So the, the the key linchpin here is: Do you get a zygote? Does fertilization occur? Can you have fusion of haploid gametes and form a successful uh, diploid cell that can go on to divide and produce an organism? Uh, so all these prezygotic barriers say no, the fertilization, fertilization is not going to happen. Postzygotic barriers say, well, fertilization can happen, uh, but something that happens after fertilization, uh, something is not quite okay with those offspring. Or maybe there is. If there are fertile, viable offspring, if there are fit offspring, then uh, we would say that there, there isn't a reproductive barrier between those two organisms, uh, that they are more likely than not of the same species. And of course I say more likely than not because uh, there's not always a hard and fast line between uh, two organisms being discrete species. So prezygotic barriers block fertilization. Uh, they can impede mating attempts, they can prevent successful completion of mating, or if you can have fertilization, uh, or if you have a mating event, uh, fertilization doesn't occur for some reason. Uh, so, let's go through some of these types of prezygotic barriers. So habitat isolation. We've got two, spe two species that don't encounter each other, uh, because they're in different habitats. So they might not be, uh, you know, miles apart from each other. They might be not be reproductively isolated by a very great distance, but just the fact that you find, uh, say for example, snakes that swim in water and spend most of their life in the water, uh, they're not going to encounter uh, these terrestrial, these land-dwelling snakes very frequently. And if they do not encounter each other, chances are they're not going to have opportunities to mate. Uh, you can have temporal isolation, and temporal means at any scale. It could be, uh, you know, day mating versus night mating. It could be uh, winter mating versus spring mating. It can be uh, a 13-year cicada versus a 17-year cicada. Uh, so many different scales 
uh, at which we can define temporal isolation with these skunks. It has to do with the season of the year. We've got uh, winter breeding skunks and summer breeding skunks, uh, which are not fertile at the same time, so they cannot uh, reproduce with each other. They cannot produce fertile, viable offspring. Uh, behavioral isolation. We know that in many species, including our own, there can be elaborate courtship rituals that uh, must be performed before a mating attempt can occur. Uh, in addition, maybe we can have mating attempts occur, but something happens after the mating attempt, but before fertilization that can impede uh, the production of a zygote. So, uh, the example I've given here is, here are two snails. And snails are hermaphroditic. They have both male and female genitalia. They produce both eggs and sperm. But uh, Darwin even observed that most hermaphroditic species of animals and plants, uh, even if they're hermaphroditic, it's very, very rare that they will self-fertilize, uh, which suggests that there are a lot of uh, enticements towards genetic variation. Having genetic variation is important and good, uh, so that even if you can mate with yourself, uh, it doesn't happen very frequently. So these snails need another snail to mate and produce these fertile, viable offspring. Well, the problem is, uh, the way that these snails are, uh, th their morphology is such that their shells have to be twisted the same way in order them for them to produce uh, progeny, for them to mate. And so there's a mechanical problem here. This snail shell is curling uh, around in a counterclockwise fashion. This snail here is curling around in a clockwise fashion. So they're, they're incompatible. They, they just can't get it together. And if you haven't seen this video yet, it's good for a little laugh. Uh, but there's some very good, important information in there as well about snail sex. Uh, gametic isolation is another pre-zygotic barrier. Uh, so take these sea urchins. Sea urchins uh, live in marine habitats, uh, and they don't have internal fertilization. So when they have sex, basically what they do is they release their gametes into their environment and just sort of hope that... The gametes are going to find compatible gametes and produce zygotes in that way. Um, so you might think, well, if there's just sort of this gamete soup out there, uh, then what's preventing these blue urchins from producing zygotes with these red urchins? Uh, and the answer is that the gametes have chemoreceptors on them that uh, are sort of like a lock and key mechanism at the molecular scale. So uh, their gametes are chemically incompatible. So their gam the gametes of the blue urchins will not fuse with the gametes of the red urchins and vice versa. So this is a form of gametic isolation. Okay? So next video, we'll talk about some post-zygotic barriers.